Good morning. Merry Christmas. <laughs> it is good to be with you guys on the Sunday before Christmas. Um, this time of year is awesome. Okay, I know you guys agree with me on that. Um, if you don't know me, hold on. That's better. If you don't know me, my name is Nathaniel Vargo. I am the youth pastor here at Freedom Bible Church. Um, I'm also a Bible teacher at Community Christian School. One of my students on Friday gave me this shirt, says the Sermonator. So I figure I'd have to wear it today since I was speaking. <laughs> but if you are visiting with us, our senior pastor, Frank Vargo, has been going through the book of 1 John. And I want to continue today with you guys in 1 John chapter 2. And if you look at my title for my sermon, it is, It Runs in the Family. When we think about family, family is... A very interesting thing. We have over a hundred families in this church today, and every single one of these families is completely different. We all have different things that, in the way that we operate, different parents, different kids, uh, but we all have things that run in our families. And when I was asking myself this question, what runs in my family? One of the very first things that came to my head is competitive. Um, <laughs> We, <laughs> some of you are like, yeah, that's definitely for sure. Um, <clears throat> we have this card game that we like to play. It's called Shanghai Rummy. When we do family get-togethers, when we do family vacations, uh, we love to play this card game. It's one of the biggest things. It's the highlight of the trip. Um, and so when we get together, we start playing, and it's fun. And then we continue to play. And then someone starts losing. And someone starts winning. And then it uh, just all falls apart from there, okay? We usually don't make it to the end of the game. And I won't mention the worst, okay? But Brittany is, yes, it is. You do not want Brittany to win, okay? If Brittany is winning, you will hear about it for the rest of your life. Even if she doesn't win at the end, it, you'll still hear about it. She was winning for about one round, and so she'll let you know she was winning. Uh, but it's so much fun, and my heart goes out to the three who married into the family. Michael, Teresa, and Tori, you guys are saints. Uh, you're awesome. Michael cracks me up because he, he doesn't care at all. You know, it's his turn, and he's on his phone. And Brittany's yelling at him like, dude, it's your turn. What are you doing? And he's like, ah, it doesn't matter. You know, because he's a Christian, and he realized it's just a card game. Okay. But, you know, that's not the only thing that runs in the family. Uh, when it comes to card games, cheating is another thing that runs in the family. And uh, those of you who are laughing the loudest, you've experienced this. And um, if you don't believe me, ask the Krogers. They can vouch that it definitely comes from our father. Okay? <laughs> that is who it comes from. But whether good or bad, we all have things that run in our family. And of course, saying the bad things, I have to say a good thing. One thing that runs in our family is love. I mean, it's such a blessing to have siblings and parents that I can say I have one of the best relationships that I have in my life. And um, love is something that runs in our family, and we are so blessed with that. Um, but we have these things, right? We have these things that we know, and there are probably some things you can think of, things that you remember uh, from your past, or things that you do when you do family get-togethers. And 1 John, in this section in chapter 2, he is talking about things that run in the family of God. When we are a part of God's family, we are going to live, we are going to act like we are a part of God's family. And there are things that we are going to do, and there are things we are going to run away from. And so before we look at these things, let's pray, and then we're going to dive into our verses for today. God, we love you. You are an incredible God. You have created everything. You have given us our families. Uh, we are so thankful for the things that you do in our lives. And so I pray, God, for our church. As we dive into this word, that you would be with us, that you would speak to us. God, I pray as we are a part of your family that we would seek to just abide in you. You are our heavenly Father. You are the one who gives us all things. And so I pray, God, that we would draw closer to you now. I pray that if there is anyone in here who is not a part of your family, that you would show them your love. Show them that you want them to be in your family. And so, God, we thank you and we trust you. Holy Spirit, 
be with us. And we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, we're going to start with 1 John 2, verses 12 through 14. It says this. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and I have, you have overcome the evil one. And so as we look at these verses, I like to call it the I write to you section, because he continually says over and over again, I am writing to you. I write to you. And in verse 12, he kind of sums it all together. He says, I write to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. And so what is John saying here? Is he writing to literally little children? No. Okay, They probably wouldn't be able to read this letter. And when we look at that phrase, little children, he actually uses it five times in 1 John, and he uses it once in 2 John. And when he uses the phrase little children, he is actually talking about believers. And he's talking about believers and he's calling them little children. Because when we become followers of Christ, when we put our faith in Christ, we become children of God. Look at these verses with me, Galatians 3:26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 6:18. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, when we put our faith in him, we become sons and daughters of God. We become a part of his family. He is literally our heavenly father. And the other reason I love this verse is because Pastor Frank has been saying it over and over again. But the idea is, guys, this letter is written to believers. This letter is not written for us to doubt our salvation. He's not writing this letter for us to doubt ourselves and say, you know what, I really got to check my life because I don't know if I'm saved and I don't know if I've truly given my life to Christ. He's saying, listen, I write to you because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. You're already saved. You've already gone through the process of salvation. You are a child of God. Amen to that. The fact is, is we are already a part of the family. When we've put our faith in Christ, we have experienced salvation and so 1 John is written for sanctification. Pastor Frank talked about this last week. We are in the process of sanctification. We are growing closer to Christ. Now that we are a part of the family of Christ, we are growing in that family. But then he does something interesting here. After he talks to the little children, all believers, he then splits them up. And he talks about, number one, the fathers. Let's look at the fathers 1 John 2, 13a and 14b says the same thing. It says, I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And now this isn't the heavenly father. This is lowercase fathers. These are our spiritual leaders. These are the ones that have been growing in their faith for years. They have been walking with Christ. They have been diving into his word. And so they are the fathers of the faith. They are the ones we look up to. They are our pastors, our elders, the ones we can trust, the one we can go to, and all of our things. And so we see he says, because you know him who is from the beginning. Who is the one from the beginning? Well, the writer from 1 John is the same writer of the Gospel of John. And John 1.1 1, 1 says, the word was in the beginning. It's Jesus Christ. And the Greek word he uses here is gnosko. It means to know or to have understanding. And so these spiritual fathers, these leaders in our churches, 
they have a deep understanding of who God is, of who he is and how we can have a relationship with him. And so the fathers, they are just our spiritual leaders. They have been walking with him for a very long time. And then we look at young men. Young men we have in verse 13, he says, I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. But then I love verse 14 because he just adds to it. He says, I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. The young men are those who are not um, just starting their faith. They're not those who have just put their faith in Christ. They are those who have been growing, those who are abiding in the word of God, learning his word, seeking him. And then through that abiding in his words, they have two things. Number one, they're strong, strong in their faith. Their faith can't be shaken when they face trials. Um, when troubles come, they are strong. They are grounded in the word of Christ. But number two, they have overcome the evil one. What's that mean? That means that temptation, things that come their way, when Satan tempts them to do things, they are grounded in God's word. And recognize here, when he talks about young men, the biggest thing is that they abide in God's word. They would not be strong and they would not be able to overcome the evil one if they were not grounded in his word. But young men are those who are grounded and they are growing in their faith and they are becoming strong where one day they will be fathers. They will grow into fathers. And then lastly, we see children. 1 John 2, 14. <clears throat> I write to you, children, because you know the Father. When we look at children of the faith, those are the ones who have just begun their walk with Christ. They are those who have found Christ. They know that they are sinners. They know they need him as a savior. And so they have just found him. And the way I like to think of children is um, we have to understand in physical adoption, when somebody becomes adopted, they have brand new parents. They don't know these parents. They don't know the things that these parents want them to do. And so in that adoption, at whatever age they are, they have to learn, right? They have to find out who their father is. They have to find out who their mother is. They are starting a brand new relationship with brand new parents. And so these children, the parents don't expect them to follow the rules right away. They don't expect them to do everything perfectly right away. They expect them to, as they grow and as their love for each other grows, they are going to begin to walk in the ways their parents want them to walk. And so in the same way, these children, those who are starting their new faith in Christ, those who are beginning to walk with him, they are new. They don't have a deep understanding of who God is. They don't have a deep understanding of God's word. But what are they going to do? They're going to grow. They're going to grow in an understanding of who he is. They're going to look at his word. And the fathers and the young men are going to step beside them and walk with them and teach them. We're not going to look down on them. We're not going to say, you're messing up, so you're probably not actually a child. That's not what we're going to do. We're going to come beside them and walk with them. But I love what he says about the children. He says, because you know the Father. Look at John 14, 7 says this. This is Jesus talking. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And the beauty is, is John is saying, listen, I'm not trying to separate you all. I'm not trying to put the fathers on a pedestal and then the young men are here and they'll grow into fathers and then children, you're down here. No, you all have the ability to know God. Because God has put himself in your life and because you recognize you are a sinner and you recognize you need him, you now have a relationship with God. You know him and he knows you and you're going to begin walking in this faith. But the idea is though, if you are a child, if you are one who is new in your faith, you're going to grow into a young man, right? Young man, sorry. And if you are a young man, you are going to continue to grow into a father. The idea here is you're not going to stay a child forever. 
Yes, I was a child at once, but I'm not anymore because I've grown. And the idea is if you're not growing, you need to start. If you're a part of the family of God, we need to be growing. We need to be seeking his word, and we need to grow in Christ. But the idea is no matter what stage you're at, you are a part of God's family. And so now that we are a part of his family, now that we are walking with him, there are a couple things that are going to happen in our lives. Our lives are going to change. We have a new father. And so because of this and the things we've already looked at in 1 John, number one, we will walk in the light. 1 John 1. We are going to walk in the light and we are going to separate from the darkness. Number two, we are going to confess our sin. We are going to realize, hey, I mess up. I'm a sinner. I confess this and I want to work on it and I want to strengthen myself so I can grow. And number three, Pastor Frank talked about last week, we will love our brothers. We're going to love the people around us because our Heavenly Father loves us. And now we look this week, 1 John 2, 15 through 17, we are going to separate from the world. Read these verses with me. It says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And so John is saying, listen, you guys, you've put your faith in Christ. You're in his family. He loves you and you love him and you are walking in his family. And so what you need to do, the biggest thing you need to do is separate yourself from the world. You're not going to love the world anymore. You're not going to walk in the world. And so the question is, what is the world? Well, when we look at the world and we think about the physical world, the world has many things. It has pleasures, passions, entertainment, food, drink, hobbies, money, work, family, friends, travel, etc., etc. The world is just the physical world we live in, the things that we do, the things we enjoy, the people we hang out with. But when we read these verses, we kind of have to read it like we read 1 Timothy 6.10. 1 Timothy 6.10, very famous verse, it says, the love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the issue. And so in the same way, when we look at these verses, we see the world, the things God has given us to enjoy. God has given us family. He's given us entertainment. He's given us food, drink, all these things. He has given to us to enjoy. However, when we love them, and the word love, it's agape, everlasting, the love we should have for God, the issue is, is our love for the world distracts us from our love for God. And our love for the world becomes more important than the things that we love God. And I love the way that Matthew Henry says this. Listen to this. He says, The things of the world may be desired and possessed, for the uses and purposes which God intended. And they are to be used by his grace and to his glory. But believers must not seek or value them for those purposes to which sin abuses them. The world draws the heart from God, and the more the love of the world prevails, the more the love of God decays. See, God has given us the world. He's given us things to enjoy. But the problem is, is when our sin steps in and our sin takes the things that God has given us and it warps them and it changes them into things that we know scripture tells us we should not do. And then the problem is because our sin warps that and then we love that sin more than we love God. The problem is, is our hearts are pushing God out and we are drawing the world in. And John goes into detail. He's saying, listen, the world, these are the desires of the world. We have the desires of the flesh. This would be pleasure, excess food, sexual sin, drunkenness, drugs, money, clothes. These are things that we physically desire to have. Uh, Desires of the eyes, basically just coveting, 
longing to have what we don't have, wanting to have more, never being content with what we have now, but always constantly wanting more. And then we have the pride of life, fame, fortune, basically the opposite of what John 3.30 says. John 3.30, he must increase, I must decrease. But the pride of life is, I must de increase. And it doesn't really matter about the rest. And the point is, is we become so consumed with these things. And we want to have them so bad that we don't even realize we are pushing God away. And sometimes we're wondering, why do I feel like God is so far away from me? Why do I feel like my relationship with God was so good, but now it's not? And the problem is, is it's the world. It's that we are allowing the world to come into our hearts and to invade the space where only God should be. And the other issue with the world is that it's not just one thing, right? It's not like we just struggle with the sexual sin. It's that we struggle with all of it. We struggle with the pride. We struggle with the money, the family, the et cetera, et cetera, everything in between. We want it all. But John is saying, go back to verse 17. He says, and the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. The thing is, guys, the world, it's going away. You can be the richest person in the entire world, and guess what? You're going to die. And it's gone. And all that money that you worked up for and all the things that you worked up for and the fame and fortune that you tried to achieve, it is going away. And there is nothing you can do about it. But the idea is those who abide in the will of God will live forever. Those who live for eternity's sake, those who live for his glory, those things will last forever. And so when we look at the world and when we look at our relationship with God, they are completely separate. Now, of course, we are called as Christians to go into the world so that we can preach the gospel. But the idea is, is we are not a part of the world. We are separate from him. And so I ask you, what is your heart seeking after? Is your heart seeking after God, your heavenly Father, the one who longs to have a relationship with you, the one who wants to give you joy and give you peace and give you a life that is filled with so much more than you can imagine? Or is your heart's cry for the world? Is your heart's desires to seek after the world more than you seek after God? And, you know, if your answer is the world, then my question is, is do you belong to a different family? Look at John 8, 42 through 47. It says this. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? Listen to this. It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Jesus makes it very clear here. You are either a part of the family of God because you have given your life to Christ, or sadly, you are a part of the family of Satan. And he says specifically, listen, you do not know my words. You do not know me because you're not a part of my family. You are a part of the family, <clears throat> family of Satan. And listen to this, and your will is to do your father's will. If your desire is for the world and your desire is to fulfill your flesh, then sadly, your father is Satan. 
because you are fulfilling his desires. You're fulfilling his will. You think you're doing your own thing. You think you're doing whatever you want to do. Sadly, you are doing exactly what Satan wants you to do. And so my question again, guys, what family do you belong to? And if you feel like you don't belong to the family of Christ, I will tell you guys, he loves you so much. And he wants you to be a part of his family. And if you're not a part of his family, right now he's not saying, yep, you're not a part of my family, get out of here. I don't want you. It's exactly the opposite of what he's saying. He's saying, draw close to me. Abide in me. And that's it. And you will be a part of my family. I will save you from your sin. I will save you from this life that is leading to destruction. And I will bring you to a life filled with joy and peace. And your life will be eternal. It's not just going to be this physical life you're living for here now. It will be eternal. And it will be forever. So I want to show you guys this picture. Um, my wife, Tori, i got to give her the credit. She's the one who found it on Facebook. So if you could put that up there. It says, if the Bible calls it a sin, your opinion doesn't matter. Okay. Um, as I saw this, and I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I'm not trying to make you feel bad about your own opinion. The point of putting this up here is I think the reason why the world and sin creeps into the church, I think the reason why as believers we allow the world into our hearts so much is because we don't take this seriously. We don't take God's word serious enough to recognize that when God says, you need to stay away from this, then we need to take it seriously. It doesn't matter that our opinion says, yeah, well, everyone's doing it and they're fine. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what we think. What matters is the truth. God's word is the truth. This is the only thing that matters, guys. And you know, I've had to say to myself a lot, listen, I can't just go answering questions. I can't just go thinking I know what's right without knowing what for sure the word of God says. And if some of you are have a personal opinion about something that's in scripture and you don't have verses to back it up, I will tell you, you need to be very, very cautious. If you are going around and telling people what you think is truth, but you can't back it up with scripture. We have to take God's word seriously and when we take his word seriously and when we abide in this, we will live like we are in his family. We will love like we are in his family. And so my prayer for you guys is that, um, and I know most of you in here, you're believers. You are here because you want to be here. You are here because you are longing to grow in Christ. And so find joy in that. Find joy that you are in his family, and so walk in his family. And if you're here and you are not a part of his family, I pray that God would open your eyes to see how much he loves you. And the last thing I want to read with you guys Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Here is the blessing of being in the family of God. Listen to this. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Let's pray. As we